Welcome to Prospective Doctors MCAT Podcast, brought to you by Med School Coach. Each week, Sam breaks down the highest yield MCAT topics so you can score as high as possible on test day. Hello and welcome to Prospective Doctors MCAT Basics with your host, Sam Smith. The goal of this podcast is to cover the highest yield topics on the MCAT and provide you with some sort of insight into the questions that the MCAT really likes to ask. I'll talk about a few different topics in this podcast. I'll talk about the different types of muscle. I'll talk about the structure of a muscle cell, specifically in the case of skeletal muscle. And I'll talk about the difference between type 1 and type 2 muscle fibers. And then I'll get into probably the most important part of this podcast, which is understanding how a muscle contracts and understanding what the cross bridge cycle is. And this material is going to show up in two out of the four MCAT sections, the first being bio-biochem and the second being chemistry physics. Although if you see some kind of muscle related question in the chemistry physics section, the odds are it's probably going to be a physics question. But this is one of those topics that's kind of like a medium yield. And I think this material can kind of tend to be a bit overlooked. So You know, you might not see a bazillion questions about this on the MCAT, but I think it's worth it to get, you know, those several questions that you may see. So with that said, I hope this episode helps in your studies and good luck. So as I said, the very first thing I want to talk about here is the different types of muscle that exist in the human body. And there's three different types of muscle or three groups of muscle that are important to know for the MCAT. The first being smooth muscle, the second being skeletal muscle, and the third being cardiac muscle. And each of these types of muscles has similarities and differences between each of the three. And I covered this in the podcast called Cell and Tissue Types. So I'm just putting in a segment from there. So here you go. What I want to do here is I want to talk about the differences and similarities between smooth, skeletal, and cardiac muscle. So for most people, this should be review. Never a bad thing to review stuff. But if not, then I hope this helps for you for the MCAT and you're learning something new. So smooth muscle is muscle that is under involuntary control. So this is things like breathing, you know, secretion of gut enzymes, blood vessel constriction, etc. And smooth muscle tissue is not striated. Hence the term smooth, right? It's smooth in appearance. It doesn't have these striations. And this is because smooth muscle fibers are not arranged in orderly sarcomers like skeletal muscle and cardiac muscle. It's also important to note that smooth muscle cells have a single nucleus. In contrast to smooth muscle tissue, skeletal muscle tissue is under voluntary control. So, you know, moving your arms around, moving your legs around, you know, peeing, that's all skeletal muscle. And they also function to protect internal organs. And skeletal muscle is striated. They have these, you know, striations, and that is due to the orderly arrangement of fibers into these things called sarcomeres. And they are also, in contrast to smooth muscle, multinucleated. So these uh, skeletal muscle cells can have multiple nucleuses. And this is because these muscle cells must be able to produce large amounts of enzymes and proteins needed for muscle contraction since they're being used almost constantly. And so in order to do this, you got to have more genetic material around that can then be transcribed and translated into these enzymes and proteins. The last type of muscle tissue I want to talk about here is cardiac muscle tissue. And as you could probably guess from the name, cardiac muscle is only found in the heart and it contracts in a very coordinated manner, obviously to you know make sure your heart is beating all together. Kind of scary if different parts of your heart were beating at different rates and probably wouldn't live very long. So like skeletal muscle, cardiac muscle is striated. However, like smooth muscle, it has a single nucleus and is involuntarily controlled. All right, the next thing I want to go over here is the structure and organization of a muscle cell or a myocyte. And again, there's three types of muscle, but the one that I'm really going to talk about here is skeletal muscle. So just keep that in the back of your mind as I'm talking about these different structures within the cell. This really only applies to skeletal muscle. And I'm only talking about skeletal muscle structure because I think it's kind of the most common that you would see if you were to see any at all. And it's kind of that general case that uh, tends to come up. So skeletal myocytes are this specialized cell type that has a job of contracting. That's really kind of what sets myocytes apart from other cells is contraction. And I'll get into what contraction exactly is in this context a little bit later in the podcast. But just know that this is really what sets 
muscle cells apart from other cells in the body. And in terms of their appearance, they tend to look a lot different than other cells that you would see under a microscope. They tend to be long and cylindrical in appearance. You might imagine like the shape of a PVC pipe. So you got this kind of oddly shaped cell, and it has different components than you would see in other cells too. So that's the next thing I want to get into is these different components that are inside myocytes. So let's start from the outside going in. Imagine that you're outside of a myocyte right now. You're looking at it. It looks like a PVC pipe. And as you move in towards this myocyte, you come across the first structure that makes up this cell. That's called the basement membrane. And the basement membrane is composed of glycoproteins and collagen. And it essentially functions to provide an initial barrier and influences the exchange of macromolecules between this extracellular space and the inside of the myocyte. In addition to that, it provides an interface for myocyte adhesion and continuity with the extracellular matrix. It kind of holds together all these myocytes, and in a sec, you'll kind of understand why that's important. And I like to think about the basement membrane as being similar to that of a cell wall. Even though it's not necessarily a cell wall, that's just kind of how I like to think about it. So as you continue to make your way towards the interior of the cell from the outside, you go past the the basement membrane, and the next component you come across is called the sarcolemma. And this is basically the plasma membrane of a myocyte. It's a lipid bilayer, and it functions exactly the same as a plasma membrane. And I should mention, too, that the sarcolemma is actually connected to the basement membrane. So it's not like the sarcolemma is just like this next layer inside the basement membrane. They're both contiguous with one another. After you make it through the sarcolemma, you get into the myocyte itself and you get into this intracellular space that has a bunch of different interesting components, one of which is called the sarcoplasm, which is just the cytoplasm of a myocyte. And then inside the sarcoplasm, there are going to be a bunch of these small rod-shaped structures that are called myofibrils. And if you think again about this muscle cell as looking like a PVC pipe, if I were to cut that PVC pipe and kind of look at that muscle, a cross section of that muscle cell, it almost looked like this PVC pipe is filled with like a bunch of little pieces of spaghetti. Like you could imagine spaghetti, dry spaghetti noodles being stuffed inside a PVC pipe. It kind of looks like that. And all these little spaghetti rods are what are called myofibrils. And there can be an absolute shit ton of these myofibrils inside each muscle cell. This can be on the order of tens of thousands of these per individual muscle cell. And each of these myofibrils is made up of sarcomeres. And sarcomeres are really important. They are the main functional or contractile unit of the myocyte. This is what makes the muscle contract. This is that single most important part of the muscle cell. And so again, you have this myofibril, and essentially all a myofibril is is a stack of sarcomers, like stacked lengthwise, like a can of beers if you were to stack them on top of each other. And these sarcomeres are made up of two different filaments. They're made up of a thin filament and a thick filament. The thick filament is made up of myosin, and the thin filament is made up of actin. And both of these filaments play a really important role in muscle contraction, and I'll get to that in a second. But just for now, understand that sarcomeres are made up of thick and thin filaments, and then sarcomeres make up myofibrils, and then you have tens of thousands of myofibrils that fill up these individual myocytes. And when I say fill up, I really mean that. Like, the majority of the space inside one of these myocytes is these myofibrils. So you can go look up a picture and you'll see what I'm talking about, but they fill up a majority of that cell. And if you're listening to all these different names and wondering why a lot of them have either this myo prefix or the sarco prefix, it's because the Greek prefix for flesh is sarco and the Latin prefix for muscle is myo. So they're taking those two prefixes from those old languages and creating all these words. And, you know, sarcoplasm is the same thing as cytoplasm. A lot of these are the same exact thing as in other cells. They just like to call them different things. 
So in addition to those components, and those are really kind of the main, most important components of that muscle cell, at least in its functionality. In addition to those, though, there are some other important components that surround these myofibrils. The first of those are mitochondria, which are sometimes called sarcosomes, and they provide muscles with ATP that is needed to contract. And there's an interesting story about mitochondria and the muscle cells when it comes to these fast versus slow twitch muscle fibers, which are type 2 versus type 1 muscle fibers. And I'll get to that in a little bit when I'm talking about the difference. But you know, just understand, there has to be mitochondria in muscle cells because muscles need a lot of ATP to contract. So in addition to mitochondria in the muscle cells, there's also what's known as sarcoplasmic reticulum, which resembles smooth endoplasmic reticulum in a normal cell, but has a little bit of a different function. And kind of the main important function of this sarcoplasmic reticulum is that it regulates calcium within the sarcoplasm. And this is a very important thing for contraction, as you will see. Muscle cells also have nucleuses because they need DNA, as DNA encodes information for different proteins, such as enzymes. And then another important component that you'll see come up is what's known as the transverse tubule, or T-tubule. And what the T-tubule does is it helps propagate action potentials deep into the muscle cell. And so it's actually an invagination of the sarcolemma in the shape of a tube. So if you go look at a picture of this, you'll see it literally looks like a tube traveling from the sarcolemma into the center of the myocyte. And I'm assuming that what would happen if you didn't have these T-tubules is that you'd have different myofibrils contracting at different times as the signal, which again is depolarization, spread throughout individual cells. So again, the T-tubule just kind of makes sure that each of the myofibrils within a single myocyte receives an action potential all at the same time so that they all contract in unison. And so one thing that actually helped me kind of remember the function of T-tubules was to think about the Boston T. And so for those of you who don't know what the Boston T is, it's just the name of the subway system in Boston. But what the subway system does, or the T in this case does, is it helps you get from the outside of the city into the city. And so in the same way, the T-tubule helps these depolarization signals get from the periphery of the cell all the way into the middle of the cell. So mitochondria, sarcoplasmic reticulum, nucleuses, and transverse tubules are all important components in myocytes, but it's important to also remember that these are cells, so they still contain a lot of the basic cell components that other cells contain, like ribosomes, lysosomes, phagosomes, Golgi, etc. So just to briefly summarize everything I just talked about, each myocyte is this rod-shaped cell that is surrounded by first a basement membrane that's connected to a sarcolemma, which is basically the cell plasma membrane. And then as you get inside this myocyte, you start to see more rod-shaped structures that are inside of the cell called myofibrils. And there can be an absolute ton of these myofibrils per individual myocyte. And these myofibrils are surrounded by mitochondria and also the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And then inside each of these myofibrils, there are a bunch of stacked up sarcomeres, which are the functional unit of the muscle cell and are what make it capable of contracting. And before I move on to the next segment of this podcast, I want to mention too that muscles in terms of being a tissue are very organized. So you have what are known as muscle cells that I just talked about, sometimes called muscle fibers. And inside of muscle tissue, you have multiple muscle fibers joined together to form what are known as fascicles. And then multiple fascicles are joined together to form the bulk muscle. So you go from the cellular level, which is muscle fibers, to the bundles of muscle fibers, which is known as a fascicle, to bundles of fascicles, which is known as bulk muscle. Thanks for checking out the Prospective Doctor MCAT Basics podcast. Sam's doing a killer job taking you through the most important MCAT topics. But what if you need a little extra help? How does a 5, 10, or even 15 point increase in your score sound? Imagine how your chances at admission could increase. Med School Coach's MCAT tutoring can get you there. With the most rigorous selection process of any tutoring company, we see amazing results. 
We deconstruct each student, find a plan that is going to work, and help execute it. That's why our students add an average 12 points to their score. Completely physician-run and operated, and focusing on nothing but medicine. It's no wonder over 10,000 past students have trusted Med School Coach to get them through the MCAT and into medical school. Check out medschoolcoach.com today and mention code PODCAST for 5% off. The next thing I want to talk about here are the different types of skeletal muscle fibers. In terms of the MCAT, really there's only going to be type 1, which are slow twitch fibers, and type 2, which are fast twitch fibers. And so as I said earlier, you know, muscles are made up of individual bundles of fibers called fascicles, and each of these individual muscle fibers or muscle cells can have a different phenotype, that being either slow twitch or fast twitch. And there are a few main differences between these fiber types. I'm going to talk about three differences. The first I'm going to talk about is their different modes of metabolism. Then I'll talk about their rate of contraction and their rate of fatigue. And then I'll I'll talk about how much myoglobin each of these fiber types has. There's differences beyond that, but those are the three I'm going to cover. All right, so let's start out with difference number one. And to me, this is the most interesting difference. So in general, type one or slow twitch fibers rely mostly on oxidative phosphorylation for energy. And remember, this oxidative phosphorylation pathway is the pathway that uses the mitochondria and ends up producing about 32 ATP in the end. And this is also known as the aerobic pathway because it requires oxygen. On the other hand, type 2 fibers, which are the fast twitch fibers, rely on the glycolysis pathway, which is also called the anaerobic pathway because it does not require oxygen. And that's kind of interesting, right? Because this glycolysis pathway is one that doesn't produce a lot of energy. Remember from the metabolism podcast or just in general, you'll remember that in glycolysis, you only generate 2 ATP and you produce 2 NADH and 2 pyruvate. But Comparing that to oxidative phosphorylation, you're not producing much energy, which to me is a bit counterintuitive, right? Because these fast twitch muscle fibers, as you'll hear in a sec, are able to contract faster. You know, these are what you're going to be using when you're sprinting or doing squats or lifting weights. And so what you'd think is that you need more ATP to do these high intensity activities, but really it comes down to the fact that glycolysis is a lot quicker than oxidative phosphorylation, right? You can produce ATP at a much faster rate, which then lets these muscle fibers contract at a faster rate, which is why they're called fast twitch muscle fibers. For the same reason, these fast twitch muscle fibers tend to be a bit bigger in diameter because they need glycogen, right? Glycogen is just the stored form of glucose. and You can break that down and uh, go through glycolysis pretty quickly to generate those ATP, but you need a big storage of glycogen because you're going to run through a lot of glucose in this process. And another thing that's related to this metabolism difference between these two fiber types is the fact that these two different fiber types have different mitochondrial phenotypes. So it's been shown that mitochondria in the slow twitch fibers tend to be more elongated and kind of interconnected, meaning that, you know, I will have two mitochondria and they tend to elongate and kind of connect with each other to form these big mitochondria. On the other hand, in the fast twitch fibers, you tend to have less mitochondria in general, and the mitochondria tend to be smaller and more fragmented. And the theory here is that since the fast twitch fibers don't really need the mitochondria because they're just doing glycolysis, that the mitochondria respond by fragmenting and becoming smaller, whereas in the slow twitch fiber, they respond by fusing together and getting bigger and elongating because those muscle cells are using oxidative phosphorylation a lot. And you might be saying, yeah, 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 obviously these mitochondria are going to change and like there's nothing cool about this. But I just think it's interesting, you know, you know, my view was always that mitochondria are kind of these static organelles that are just there to produce energy and that's kind of all they do. But it is interesting to kind of know that they can change their phenotype based upon the energy needs of the cell. All right, so all of that was to say that in general, type 1 or slow twitch fibers rely mostly on oxidative phosphorylation for energy, whereas type 2 or fast twitch fibers rely mostly on glycolysis, which is also known as the anaerobic pathway. The next difference, and I kind of alluded to it earlier, was that in general, fast twitch fibers have a faster contractile rate but they fatigue faster. That's something that I didn't mention. And they fatigue faster because you're only producing 2 ATP per round of glycolysis, which is what these muscle fiber types are relying on. So in other words, 
in the fast twitch fiber, you're going to be creating all this ATP very rapidly through glycolysis, which is going to mean you can contract that muscle very fast. But because you're using this glycolysis pathway, you're going to run through all of your stored glycogen and your muscle is going to fatigue quickly. On the other hand, slow twitch muscle fibers tend to be slower in contracting, but also slower to fatigue. These are the muscle fiber types that you would use if you're, say, jogging or walking or doing some kind of low impact activity. And again, this goes back to metabolism, right? These slow twitch fibers like to use the oxidative phosphorylation pathway, and therefore they're a little slower in producing ATP, but they can produce a lot more. So yes, they may be slower to contract, but because you have this plethora of ATP32 being made, then this muscle is going to be a little bit slower to fatigue. The last difference I want to talk about here is in myoglobin. So fast twitch muscles tend to have less myoglobin. Slow twitch muscles tend to have more myoglobin. And myoglobin is just a protein that's able to kind of hold on to oxygen. And so that makes sense that slow twitch fibers would have more myoglobin. And what this myoglobin does is it actually makes the muscle look a little bit more red. So if you were to look at a cross section of muscle, like on a slide under a microscope, you'd see that the slow twitch fibers appear to be more red than the fast twitch fibers would be a little more white in appearance. So if for whatever reason you were given like an image on the MCAT of like a microscope slide and asked which fiber type, just remember that slow twitch fibers are more red, fast twitch fibers are lighter, typically more of like a white color or pink at least. And so one last thing I want to mention before the next segment of the podcast is where these fibers are found in the muscle. So what you typically see is that these fiber types are intermingled in the muscle, meaning that if I sliced a muscle lengthwise and looked at the cross section, these different fiber types would be kind of interwoven. I wouldn't just have, you know, a clump of fast twitch and a clump of slow twitch. They're kind of weaved in with each other. And depending upon the muscle group I look at, there are varying proportions of these fiber types. So for example, the human soleus leg muscle is predominantly made up of type 1 fibers, which again are slow twitch fibers, whereas the tricep or triceps arm muscle is predominantly type 2 muscle fibers, which are fast twitch. And in contrast to the tricep, the bicep is more of like a 50-50 mix of fast twitch and slow twitch. And the bicep and tricep are actually known as an antagonistic muscle pair, meaning that one of the muscles contracts while the other relaxes. For instance, if I flex my bicep, I'm relaxing some of the muscles in my tricep. I flex my tricep, I am relaxing some of the muscles in my bicep. So those are antagonistic muscle pairs. And I've seen that come up, so I thought I'd just mention that. And the very, very last thing I want to say before I go into the next segment is that fiber type is very plastic. In other words, a fiber can switch types if they need to do so. So say that you've been training and working out a lot, you've been lifting weights and you've been doing squats, say. Over time, you'll actually start to train your muscles more and more and you'll have more and more of these fast twitch muscle fibers developing in your legs. All right, the last thing I want to talk about in this podcast is muscle contraction, and more specifically, skeletal muscle contraction. And I'm going to talk about skeletal muscle contraction just because I think it's kind of the prime example and the example you are most likely to see on the MCAT. And the intro to this part is a little bit boring in my opinion, so I jazzed it up with a little beat. Here you go. So as I said, the sarcomere is made up of thick filaments, which are myosin, and thin filaments, which are actin. And according to the sliding filament theory, which was developed in 1954 using high-resolution microscopy, which is crazy that they were able to see this under a microscope, but they said that the sliding filament theory was that muscle contraction is a result of sliding the actin or thin filaments past the myosin or thick filaments. And what scientists saw under the microscope essentially was that the myosin filaments seemed to stay the same length, whereas the actin filaments tended to shorten. So let's talk about what happens during muscle contraction, starting from the beginning with depolarization. So let's say that you're playing the piano and you want to make your right index finger press a specific key. You know, maybe you're trying to play some chord or something. And so the first thing that needs to occur is that the nervous system needs to send a signal. This signal is going to come in the way of an action potential from the brain down to the finger via a motor neuron. 
So that signal is going to travel all the way down that nerve till it reaches the end of the nerve at a place that's called the nerve terminal. And past this nerve terminal, you're going to have a bit of space between the nerve and the muscle, and that's called the neuromuscular junction. And once this action potential reaches the nerve terminal, a neurotransmitter called acetylcholine is released into the neuromuscular junction. And just like a lot of other neurotransmitters in the brain, this acetylcholine neurotransmitter is stored in vesicles that are released into that neuromuscular junction or that gap between the neuron and the muscle cell. Now, once this acetylcholine is released into this junction, it's going to diffuse across the gap and it's going to bind to receptors on the muscle cell. And these receptors are called nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. And these are receptors that are actually embedded in the sarcolemma. And it's important to know here too that if you see the word motor end plate, they're just talking about the postsynaptic muscle cell or the muscle cell in your finger in this example that has those nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. Now, binding of the acetylcholine to this receptor on this muscle cell on the motor end plate causes sodium channels in the sarcolemma to open, which then cause the cell to depolarize. And that's how that signal is transduced from the neuron in the nerve terminal to the muscle cell. I should mention as well that this depolarization spreads throughout the cell via the T-tubules. The T-tubules help kind of evenly spread out this wave of depolarization so that then when the next step occurs, it's evenly done throughout the whole cell. And so the next step is that this depolarization causes the sarcoplasmic reticulum to release a bunch of calcium ions. And now once you have this access of calcium floating around in the muscle cell, muscle contraction can occur, and you soon begin what is known as the cross-bridge cycle. But before the cross-bridge cycle actually happens, a few things need to occur. First, calcium binds to troponin, which is a protein that's actually not found in smooth muscle. It's found in both skeletal muscle and cardiac muscle. And what this causes is a conformational change in another protein called tropomyosin. And this conformational change in tropomyosin exposes the binding site on the actin filament. And this is the binding site where the myosin head of the thick filament will actually bind to that actin filament. And if you've ever seen an image of these thick filaments, you'll notice that they have these little appendages sticking off of them. And those are myosin heads. And if you don't know what that looks like, if you haven't seen that before, go Google a picture real quick. But basically, it looks as you would imagine, like a fiber, a protein fiber, and then sticking off the sides are these little myosin heads, just little appendages. So to summarize that, essentially you have this access of calcium floating around, binds to troponin, which causes a conformational change in tropomyosin, which then unveils this binding site where the myosin head can bind the actin filament. Now, once this actin-myosin binding site is uncovered, the cross-bridge cycle can begin. And the cross-bridge cycle is broken down into four steps. And I really recommend putting these on note cards and just memorizing them if you haven't done so. I think it's something that's good to know. The first step in the cross-bridge cycle is cross-bridge formation. So to start, you have this myosin head on the thick filament, and it's bound to a hydrolyzed ATP molecule, meaning that there's an ADP and an organic phosphate that are both attached to it. And then on the other hand, you have the thin filament, which is actin, and it's just an unbound filament just kind of sitting there. And it's important to keep in mind that at this point, the thick filament and the thin filament are kind of overlapping. So they're right next to each other, but kind of facing opposite directions, if you will. So in this first step, the myosin head on the thick filament binds the actin, and you release the inorganic phosphate leaving ADP. In step two, which is called the power stroke step, this ADP is released, and what this does is this causes the myosin head to pivot, which in turn causes the sarcomere to shorten by pulling on the thin actin filament. So again, in the power stroke step, the release of ADP causes the myosin head to pivot, which causes the sarcomere to shorten. The next step is called cross-bridge detachment, and that's the third step. And in this step, ATP binds to the myosin head, and the myosin head detaches from the thin filament or the actin filament. 
And then in the fourth or final step of the Crossbridge cycle, which I call the reactivation of the myosin head, the ATP is hydrolyzed to ADP and inorganic phosphate, and this activates the myosin head. And what this does is it causes the myosin head, which was kind of pivoted or in a different conformation, to go back to its original conformation. It recocks that myosin head. And now you're back to the beginning of the cycle, right? You have this myosin head that's attached to ADP and also an inorganic phosphate, and it's ready then to go back and bind the actin filament. And again, this is a cycle, so I think it's important to remember that this cycle happens a bunch of times in order to continuously shorten the sarcomere so that a muscle can contract. It's not just like one of these cycles is going to cause your bicep to fully contract. You know, you're going to have to go over this cycle a bunch of times in order for your muscle to contract as much as you want it to. So just keep that in mind. And to do that, of course, you need a continuous supply of ATP, as we talked about, and if you're a fast twitch muscle fiber, then you're going to get that ATP pretty quickly from glycolysis. If you're a slow twitch fiber, then you're going to get that from the oxidative phosphorylation pathway. All right, in this last part of the podcast, I want to mention two other concepts you might see related to muscles on the MCAT, one being muscle sensitivity or fine motor skills versus gross motor skills, and then thermoregulation via muscles. So let's talk first about muscle sensitivity. And by muscle sensitivity, I kind of mean more like muscle coordination sensitivity. Take, for example, when you hit a piano key with one of your fingers. In order to do that motion, you need pretty fairly fine motor skills, meaning that you need very precise controlled movements in order to press on the key that you want to press on. And these fine motor skills typically require the coordination of the many small muscles together. On the other hand, you have what are known as gross motor skills, which are basically large body movements. And that's things like jogging, walking, and these movements typically use fewer but bigger muscles in coordination. And so I think one thing that you should know about fine motor skills versus gross motor skills is that when you have these finer movements, you tend to have more nerves per muscle cell. So again, say you're hitting a piano key, you know, one of the muscle cells in your finger might be innervated by one nerve, let's say, in order to control it. And then in that way, you can have all these individual muscles being controlled individually so that you can make these precise movements. On the other hand, with gross motor skills, you have less nerves per muscle cell. So, you know, you might have a single nerve that, let's say, controls multiple bundles or fascicles or, you know, tens of thousands of muscle cells. So just to quickly summarize, fine motor skills typically require the coordination of many small muscles to do these very precise controlled movements, whereas gross motor skills typically require a fewer number of muscles, but they're typically bigger, and they're these whole body movements. Another thing that muscles can be used for is to generate heat in the body when you're cold. So when you get cold, your body temperature drops, or I guess it's kind of the other way around. Your body temperature drops and you feel cold, and your muscular system can help you bring your temperature back to a normal range through a process that you have probably never heard of before, but it's a process called shivering. And what's going on during shivering is actually pretty simple. Heat is a byproduct of all exothermic biochemical reactions. Again, if you remember from general chemistry, an exothermic reaction is just a reaction in which heat is released. You have a negative change in enthalpy for exothermic reactions. So anyways, as your muscles are shaking, they need to continue to break down glucose and consume ATP as they do that. And so those reactions generate heat, and that heat can actually warm up the body. And so the more vigorous you shake, the more energy is consumed by the muscles, and hence the more heat is released, and hence the more your body temperature will rise. And exercise actually does the same exact thing. You know, as you're lifting weights or running or, you know, shake weighting, whatever you like to do, your muscles are going to be consuming ATP and you know, breaking down glucose and those reactions are going to produce heat. And so you're going to heat up. According to this paper that I read by Kazunobu Okazaki, your body actually raises its temperature by about two to three degrees during exercise. And again, this is for the exact same reason as your body temperature raises during shivering. But two or three degrees Celsius is really a significant amount of heat, right? That's it's just kind of interesting to know. 
And here's a quick brain teaser for you. If your body temperature rose by 3 degrees Celsius, by how many degrees Fahrenheit did your body temperature raise? It's 3. And that does it for this episode of Perspective Doctors MCAT Basics, which has been renamed just to MCAT Basics, still sponsored by Perspective Doctor and Med School Coach. As always, thanks for listening to this episode. Hope this podcast helped. If you feel it did, go leave us a review on iTunes. It helps us reach more students, and I always like seeing them. Good luck as you study for the MCAT. And please shoot me any business-related emails if you are interested in my sick beats. Thanks for listening to Prospective Doctors MCAT Podcast. If you're a pre-med, you'll want to check out prospectivedoctor.com for tons of free tools, articles, and more podcasts that cover your pre-med life. And if you need help on the MCAT or getting into med school, check out medschoolcoach.com for the experts.